Hey, Dane. Hey, Ina. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. We are live on LinkedIn for right. Emergence Finding the Future today. Yep. Well, it's a great topic. You know, I think that I'm just thinking there's so much stuff that's happening right now. It's January of 2024. Mm -hmm. um, you and I were having a conversation yesterday where a lot of people that we've been talking to, both of us independently, uh, not just clients, are feeling worried, concerned. They feel like things are slow. They don't know what's going on. T tell me what you've been hearing from people. Yeah, primarily entrepreneurial um, types of people. I think that there's a certain sense of um, uncertainty. I sometimes position from a positive, uh, although in other cases, it's very much of like, I may stop what I'm doing and just go, you know, look at for a corporate role somewhere and just kind of do as I'm told versus seeking out potentially new opportunities or diversifying revenue streams or looking really going outside of the comfort zone. I think that a lot of people are restructuring and repositioning in the beginning of this year. And that's the trend that I'm seeing. So one of the questions we ask a lot is what wants to happen? You know, if trying to trying to navigate your way through everything that's going on, being able to look around you and have a sense of what wants to happen is important because if we just think that all the same old stuff is going to go on, which is kind of the way our brain works, mm -hmm. um, then we're in trouble. So I, you and I have been using the word emergence. Yeah. Means how do you identify and see the emerging future? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's would be a great way to start today. How do you how do you think of what that means? How do, what, what does emergence mean to you? Yeah, I always equate it to like upstream thinking. Um, yeah. It's it's versus. Uh, you know, we can see all the problems maybe in front of us, but it's very often going back to the source of what may be causing it. And I think that if we were to put it in the context of what's going on in January 2024 and a lot of the, the feelings um, that people are sharing, honestly, let's go back to 2020 <laughs> and, and, and the course of the past, you know, three years going on four years um, yeah. of the massive amounts of change that have taken place, not only in the workplace, I think with organizations, the way that they think, the way that they commercialize, you know, initiatives, products, services. Um, there's a lot of change. And I would say, and this is honestly, maybe it's just a personal thing, but that the past two years, there was a certain kind of comfort zone that was formed yeah. um, subconsciously for a lot of businesses. And I do feel like last year um, there was a little bit of a push. We saw some layoffs happening. Uh, we saw a lot of things in the media press of, you know, changes is, is here and we're, we're going to change things. And I think we're seeing the, effects and the outcome of of that the, some of the changes that were taking place last year into yeah. this year which is continuing um yeah. and i think if you're not pivoting in business or as a leader uh and really at least taking the time to reimagine or visualize the future <laughs> finding the future today you're behind yeah I think so. And, you know, you, you, you brought up 2020 and listen, I, you know, this, I, when 2020 hit um, and I thought, God, I'm, I'm living in the second pandemic that I lived in. Cause I went through the, the polio epidemic, you mm -hmm. know, when I was a kid. Um, so I, I read every, every, well, I didn't read every book I could have found, but I read about seven books on pandemic, starting with uh, Camus, the plague. Right. Mm -hmm. And, one of the things that's really clear in the history of pandemics is that they are almost always followed by an intense period of two things, of three things. One is uh, an intense period of innovation. And the second is social unrest because so many things change. And the third is sometimes uh, for out of fear going to uh, fascistic governments or, or governments that are really dictatorial. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
when you look at that, that's pretty interesting. I mean, look at the 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 uh, flu epidemic in 1919. What immediately followed was uh, huge uh, technological things. By the by, five years later, you could fly across the country in an airplane, and you could listen to radio and national programs coming from New York, which you couldn't do before World War One. So you it, it changed everything from local and train to this is expansive sense of the world. Um, it also uh, uh, made some real social changes, you know, very, very open changes in the way people thought about sexuality, living in the cities, doing all this stuff. And then it was followed by fascism. So mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that fascism always has to follow, but in every case, there's, there's things that come like that. So I think when we look and talk about emergence and what wants to happen, I think that one way to look at it is, okay, how can we be part of making the good things happen? Mm. Um, I, so I was on a call, we were both on a call yesterday uh, with, with somebody who was talking about what he does in AI. And he was talking about how he's been developing a product that takes your, your, everything you've written, all of your thinking and everything, and condenses it in so that you can have an AI product that will think the way you think on the topics that you've thought about and already reflect your original writing. Which, boy, did that catch my ear? You know, I've got I've got years of speeches for some of the biggest uh, CEOs in the world. If I could pull that thinking into some place where I could go in and say, "How do we solve this problem?" That would be an interesting. Not that I tr would trust the solution. But it was an interesting place for me to start to say, okay, well, wait a minute, is this right or wrong? But that's mm -hmm. a new thing. Who'd ever thought that would come? Even five months ago, nobody was thinking you could do that. Maybe they were thinking, nobody told me. Um, so this idea of, there's this great uh, William Gibson quote, uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, and I love that, which means that Rather than future casting, maybe what we ought to be doing is present casting and finding the elements of the future that are already here, but just nobody's noticed. And we've got two examples I think are pretty good. Um, when Thomas Jefferson and the guys were writing the Declaration of Independence, um, this was supposedly radical stuff, the idea of democracy and the idea of all men are created equal and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but when they put it together and presented it before the uh, Continental Congress, nobody argued about the ideas. They just argued about the language and they were proofreading it because mm -hmm. those ideas were really circulating a lot in Europe at the time and in America. It's just that nobody else was in the position of starting a new government. But here we were and could start a new government on these new ideas or take the iPhone as uh, I know it's an uh, overused example. But every part of the iPhone was, was already there. It mm -hmm. was just nobody had put them all together. I remember sitting with a Palm Pilot, which had internet, and thinking, God, if this only had a phone, cell phone, and video, this would be a phenomenal device. Yeah. Right? It wasn't in the business of being able to do that. So, so I guess, how do we find the emerging present? What do you, th what, what do you think? Well, <laughs> I think it's a, a, definitely a series of, uh, I don't have the answer for that. I, I think that there's certain steps that you can take. And I think this is a really good time to buckle down and, and reevaluate strategic planning. Yeah. Um, I think it's going through and beyond that, right? So if we really think about emergence and finding the future today, sometimes it's environmental cues. I think it's... Um, networking, going back and having some of those critical conversations, not to put yourself like lock yourself in a room and create some business plan in a vacuum. I think it's really important to actually get back live and, um, you know, just kind of get the pulse of uh, have the conversations. I mean, I'm very even grateful to have had the conversations so far, you know, it's only the 24th January, but you, you know, the month's not ending yet. And I've had at least a dozen conversations of how yeah. people are feeling and thinking, and it's provided uh, a little bit of 
fire and motivation for myself to consider what's really going on here in the market. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, essentially recreate a plan for, for the year, as opposed to just following exactly the formula that was last year's formula yeah. or the year before that. I think that's great. I think, so one thing you brought up upstream thinking before, mm -hmm. uh, and I, boy, is that something that's, that's current right now? So much time is spent uh, trying to, to fix the, the results of bad thinking rather than going upstream and stopping the problem that's creating the results. And one example I can give with, without in any way being political, but remember a couple of last year, I guess, or the year before, there were all these uh, immigrants from Haiti down at the border trying to get in. It was a big problem. And, and so, you know, everybody was trying to solve the problem uh, at the border of the U.S.-Mexico border. But the problem was in Haiti. Mm. The problem was that these people had had to leave Haiti 10 years before and had right. gone mostly to Colombia, who had really successful careers in Colombia, families doing really well. And suddenly the COVID hits, Colombia kicks them out. Mm. And where did they go? Um, they decided the only place they could go was to actually walk across Panama and all the way up uh, to the border, hoping they could get enough. That's desperate. If something could be done to get them back to take all of this knowledge that they gained in Colombia and all of this entrepreneurial knowledge and stuff and get that back into Haiti in a safe way that could help Haiti grow, mm -hmm. start to solve the problem at its core. And again, yeah. I don't mean to be political about yeah. and 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 all of that, but that's an example of upstream thinking. How do we do that? Yeah. What would you say if, um, just to keep on the upstream thinking, in terms of what challenge do you feel we had to all overcome that maybe the cause has not been fully addressed by either businesses or leaders that were continuing to see, you know, a continuation of, you know, the oopsies that pop, pop up. Well, I think, I think one of the biggest issues that's still out there a lot, uh, and I see articles about it all the time, is the whole idea of, of hybrid workspaces and all of this. And some people say that's okay. Some people say uh, we got to stop that. It's the worst thing ever. And there's sort of good good things on both sides of, of why that is. It is important. When we're in, in physical proximity, it does have an effect on, on who we're being. But um, there's other people, very smart people, who are saying, look, this is the future. Live with it. Let's deal with it. So how can we stop it being a problem and turn it into a benefit? And I think we've, we've done that because we were all ready for a couple of reasons, doing most of our coaching uh, through Reservoir over Zoom because we had clients around the country. And we could have, you know, flown to Savannah, Georgia uh, for, for the first client we had there and spent three days a week, a month, you know, coaching everybody to fly back at a lot of expense. Or we could do it on Zoom uh, and cost them less and, and actually make us more money, frankly, because we weren't spending all the, all the time flying. So that was an example of it. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing that ever since when COVID hit, we had to anyway. And so now it completely makes sense. We had a, a think tank uh, yesterday uh, for uh, link, uh, for LinkedIn, for uh, um, Reservoir Circle. We had a kickoff for the Reservoir Circle. And we had people from as far away as South Africa, uh, Mexico, Canada, uh, Netherlands, all yeah. talking, just having a great time sharing their ideas and sharing their problems and challenges. Uh, and it was the beginning of a really great relationship with 12 people. Imagine if we said to you guys, okay, we want you, but you're going to have to fly in from Cape Town uh, yeah. once a month for a talk. It would make no sense at all. But now we can do that. Um, the, yeah. other, the other thing that I think is I want to throw an idea in, which is um, the future is on the fringe. Mm. And, and I, so if, if you want to find out where the future is, go, A, go talk to younger people. B, go talk to people who are maybe outliers 
they're they're doing strange stuff in here in Austin or that that doesn't look like it's very important. But mm. there's the future is always on the fringe. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the Beatles were playing in the club in Hamburg. They have talked what's you couldn't get more on the fringe in 1962. They came back and then changed music for the whole world. So, well, yeah, and that probably leads to creativity is like the best uh, area to look into when yeah. you're thinking about innovation and just seeing what the creatives are doing and seeing what yeah. designers and, you know, production artists, I just video, film, what's Absolutely. trending, you know, in terms of independent films. I think that that's such a important piece that many people forget about in business you know yep. it's very much of like go back to you know all the different strategies and let's do a SWOT and let's see what competitors are doing but you know what about advice of let's go let's watch this movie and let's see what's you know <laughs> let's yep. let's read this magazine you well you, you you went last friday to that exhibit at the uh the museum and I I know that this happened to you then, but it happens to me. If I have some spare time in town, I'll go to a museum and I usually always have like an aha moment because all the stuff that I've been trying to work out changes as I sh shut that muscle down and I'm just experiencing what I'm seeing here and suddenly that boom, an aha. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's uh, meditative, yeah. yeah. Henri Poincaré was trying to solve a, uh, a really difficult uh, mathematical theorem that nobody had ever been able to do. He got so frustrated. He said to hell with it, took the family and they took some relatives and they met up in the South of France and were, they were just getting on a bus to go visit some Roman ruins. As he put his left foot on the step of the bus, and this is in the 1920s, um, he suddenly saw the whole thing. Hmm. He saw it with such clarity. He didn't even have to stop and write a note. He right. got on the seat and continued his conversation with his cousin. And after dinner that night, went down and wrote Poincaré's theorem. I mean, and mm. there's so many stories in physics with people have done that. So, yeah, we were talking about Oppenheimer, right? Yeah. Well, and and talk about. Or, I just learned this of uh, something I was writing a couple of weeks ago, and, and came across this orthogonal thinking, which it shows up in Oppenheimer. But it's when you get people from different disciplines coming together to try to look at a problem. So early on in the world of, of trying to break the genetic codes in the early part of the 20th century, um, a bunch of uh, biologists decided, let's talk to some physicists. So they brought in um, Schrodinger and some of these other names that I don't remember. I recognize his name. And when they started looking at genetic code and what that meant, but they were seeing it through the lens of basically the shape of the universe and the forces that held planets and molecules together. Suddenly they were able to have all these discoveries and rethink how to do it. So think about how we could do that. Think about how our clients could do that. Um, yeah. One example I've been using is, you know, so we were talking about um, uh, the idea of what should hybrid work look like? Well, if, if I was with Hen Henry S. Miller and, and was asked to, let's do a project on thinking how to design hybrid workspaces that would work. What if you went out and got a set designer from Hollywood who's used to creating an environment that fits a story? Mm. It thinks of that, but hybrid work is a story. What's the story there? And what does that story need to be supported? And what would the space look like? And that's just one example, but anything you're trying to think well if you were trying to streamline service uh, stuff from uh, tech companies what if you went out and got the pit crew chief of a nascar team who's really used to streamlining processes to a matter of seconds to change four tires and Absolutely. yeah what would that look like i can't think like him but whoa if i listen to him what could he tell us right yeah, I really love that. So let's hire. Some. <laughs> I guess it's it's looking for the tip the tipping points. How do we do that as as we're moving forward into this kind of 
cloudy landscape that we can barely see what's ahead of us. What are the tipping points that tip us off? What would you look for? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if this is the right answer to, to the question, but it's the only answer I have. I think I would look for the, the amount of engagement and joy that people are experiencing, the, the, their connection. I was watching the Blue Zones again last night, um, yeah. you know, in terms of just living a, a long life. And, uh, you know, one of them is just understanding what your purpose is. It's going back to the Ikigai and going to the, um, you know, there's in different cultures, there's a different understanding, but it's waking up in the morning and knowing what your purpose is. And yeah. I think that there's not, you know, we can send out all the surveys we want in the world of, you know, how engaged are you? How's your workplace? Is it engaged, motivated? What's the feedback? And I think you'll see some insights, but what would be interesting really as a tipping point to really measure that in a different way that's not a survey is just seeing some smiles on people's faces. I, you know, I, yeah. I know it sounds so simple and, but it's really just being present and, and, really having conversations with each of your employees, really having conversations with your colleagues, having those conversations that are outside of work, understanding what's going on in people's personal lives. And going back to what I was mentioning, even, you know, the past three years of, you know, COVID 2020, the whole thing, mental health took a, took a hit. Um, and I think very, much so there's a big portion of the workforce that's just kind of like putting on a face. And I think when you have those more in-depth personal conversations, um, you're getting a little bit more insight on really what's going on. Yeah. And I think that's a really good tipping point because think about leadership. I mean, think, think about leadership if somebody is miserable and just feels like they need to hit the numbers and are not connected to purpose, but yeah. they show up, you know, and, and they try to do the thing and um, think about the solutions that are coming out of that as what's incubating there. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen that with so many of our clients, when, when you get the pulse up where people are really tur turned on and tuned into what they're doing and really loving the work and thinking about what the customers need and thinking about what stuff they they love that they want to do it and right things start happening they start you know going to each other and say what if we did this this way this it takes us too long to do this process yeah. what if we straighten this up right um, you know a lot of our clients that we we work with have been working on the the handoff of between somebody goes and sells the processes the tech processes and then somebody then has to take the contracts and the orders and then turn that into a service call to install it and do that. Mm -hmm. And that's always been a, a tough place. As they've gotten better at that, it's made it so much easier for their clients to get what they needed, so much easier for the people in the field to install what needs to be done. It just makes it so much easier and saves them so much time and money. Customers are happy. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really there. So, what would you say your tip, like what tipping point would you be looking for? Oh, you know, I think, I think what we're really looking for uh, with our clients is, is how do you get people to just stop for a second and say, what, what really matters here? What wants to happen and what matters most? And then focus on those two things. And if you can see something wants to happen, then that probably is what matters most and how you do that. Mm. Uh, I, I think one thing that is always there for me is the idea of, that you should, on one hand, live in touch with your times. So we live in 2024. We've got to be really in touch with what's going on. On the other hand, read history. Because, you know, yeah. those who are ignorant of history are forced, condemned to relive it. You know, we're going to go through it over and over again, failing at this. But if we read the history, just of technology, some of the, just the books that have talked about the history of the tech business. If you understand that, then just kind of like, oh, okay, that's how that happened. That's what happened. Well, what's, what's going on now that could happen with it? 
and maybe it's going to happen around AI. Things will happen around there for sure. Maybe it's going to happen around the way we communicate and work together. Maybe it's going to happen around things that we're all doing but haven't thought about putting this and that together to, to get them. I think, mm. I think one thing is there's a crossroads of the external mind and everything that we're seeing around us with the internal mind and what we're seeing internally. Maybe it's in a dream. Maybe it's like Poincaré stepping onto the thing. But it's when those two intersections meet that we mm. can make things happen. And, and I can think of so many examples where people did that. And suddenly a new thing was happening. Somebody walked into a room and played something on a guitar, right? That was different from anybody ever heard. And suddenly everybody else in the room is going, oh, well, wait a minute. What if you did this? And, and start playing that. And, you know, just to bring it home, you and I do that all the time. You know, I'm a boomer. You're a millennial. Um, I'll have an idea that I think makes sense. You'll say, Dane, that doesn't make any sense at all. What if we did it this way? And then together we come up with something that's brand new. Yeah. Definitely. And I love working that way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, divergent thinking, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the importance of that. There's uh, Kevin Kelly, who's, who started uh, um, a lot of stuff in Silicon Valley and, and Fast Company and all of that. Um, he was looking for a word that was, there was the scale of, of dystopia, which is when nothing's working and, and society is in trouble, and utopia, which is when everything's perfect. Well, he said, okay, we, well, obviously we don't want to create dystopia, so we, how do we stay away from that? And we'll never create utopia because that's a myth. So right. in between, what's there? What could it be? And he came up with the word protopia, which is making the world that works better now. And as soon as we get there, we work to make it even better. You know, yeah. And how do we do that. And, and I think there's a lot of people engaged in that right now. A lot of our clients are, you know, we have, we have clients who are spending a lot of time thinking about uh, the environment, uh, uh, social justice, uh, and I don't mean that in the political sense, but just where people are, are able to have a good job and work and do stuff. And bringing all that together, that's a real cross -tubes. That's That's the way to Protopia. Yeah. How yeah. Would, no. How would you see it from, from, from your point of view? Yeah, I think I would agree that everyone's kind of looking for, for that um, happy balance in the middle of uh, how to approach certain challenges and perceive new opportunities. Um, I had a thought and it completely ran away from me, but <laughs> it, was, it was something that you said about utopia and dystopia. Um, I mean, I would, I would probably say the best way to approach the next couple of months would be to try going outside of a comfort zone. Yeah. Trying new things, unconventional thinking. Um, yeah. And even if that was obviously, if that's something that was done for a company uh, leader last year, the year before, I would say that this is the year to keep doing that, even you know, doubling down on that. Um, yeah. There's a lot of change that's happening around us. You know, AI is a big trending topic, and what that is potentially creating, you know, a wealth gap and so on and so forth. And everyone's leaning into AI, that at least in conversations that I'm hearing. And that wasn't as trending last year, I have to say. I mean, it's really like as if every conversation I have now has to do with AI, generative AI, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is a good time to lean in yeah. to experiments and at the same time, always consider the implications because with any in innovation um, and going back to Oppenheimer and going, you know, to the yeah. beginning of Facebook, now Meta and, you know, all of the implications of how, what effect 
laws on society. I think um, I think it's important to to be meditative in the process of yeah. what wants to happen. Get at that that crossroads of the external thinking and the internal thinking, and see what. Yeah. So this is this has been great. We're at the end of our time, but yeah. a great conversation. We need to do it. Well, let's have more of them. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.